Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to School of Visual Arts. Uh, my name's Tom Hoon. I chair the BFA program in Visual and Critical Studies, which is sponsoring this, uh, this evening's panel discussion, which uh, promises to be uh, quite interesting and, and perhaps even provocative. I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, Saul Ostro, who organized this evening's event. Um, Saul, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Saul back to SVA, um, our school, but SVA is also his school. It's a place where Saul taught and I hope will teach again soon. Uh, that's my next phrase, <laughs> but so too, um, Saul attended SVA for four years as an undergraduate before he went on to earn his MFA from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Saul was um, shortly thereafter and for many years a practicing artist in addition to being a teacher. However, Saul is no doubt best known for his work as an independent critic and a curator. Indeed, since 1987, Saul has curated more than 70 exhibitions here and abroad. He's also best known as an author and editor. He served for many years as the art editor at Bomb Magazine. In addition, Saul was the co-editor of Lusitania Press until 2004, as well as the editor of the book series Critical Voices in Art, Theory, and Culture, published by Rutledge. It's a very uh, wonderful series of books. In fact, I can especially recommend one there on the work of Arthur Danto. Uh, well, uh, uh, <laughs> it's my book in the series, yes, but um, it is a good book. Um, more importantly, uh, yeah, yeah, Saul recently founded La Table Ronde and 21st Street Projects, both of these as a response to the complex and changing conditions that affect the emergence of new practices and ideas within the field of cultural production. Via roundtable discussions and artist projects, these endeavors seek to provide a platform for the exchange of the diverse points of view necessary for the evaluation of those current critical, theoretical, and practical objectives that impact cultural production. And this evening's discussion will center around uh, some of those themes as well. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Saul Ostro. Okay. Uh, I'm going to brief introduction to tonight's topic, and then uh, there'll be a series of one of presentations by by the panelists concerning what they do, and then there'll be a second set of presentations in terms of their comments on the topic, and then possibly some cross conversation. And then we'll open it to statements and questions from the audience. I have, for, I have now, for over 40 years, been tracking the development of those cultural practices that have increasingly used the space of art to engage in social, political, cultural modeling, and activism. The roots of the present tendency seem to lie in Joseph Boyce's notion of social sculpture introduced in the 70s. Then the institutional critique of the 1980s, which was followed by the emergence in the 90s of those practices associated with the term relational aesthetics. This tradition has become so deeply rooted that one can now even get an MFA degree in social and critical practices. Subsequently, I recently went to Creative Times Summit and was impressed by the range of activities that they assembled to reflect the varied practices developed by artist activists. But given that I'm an unrepentant Marxist-Leninist, what has both amused me and worried me is the degree to which these practices have significantly been institutionally embraced and promoted. Much of the work appears to be supported by arts councils, foundations, government grants, and museums. In Europe, this trend has even has had even wider effect and in some cases has led to the rethinking of the museum as a social and educational institution rather than a cultural one. 
which in turn has resulted in programs of community-based institutional activism. In part, I think this has to do with the fact in Europe that such institutions tend to be public rather than private as the ones are in the United States. We have been supplied with significant examples of politicized art and, and a few artists who offer up real models on both the left and the right of cultural, social, and political activism extending from the Enlightenment on within what might be called the modern period. This is part of a tradition in which art was to be moral in its promotion of human values. Consequently, today, social practices in the main, independent of any organized political program, tend to focus on issues such as creating sustainable environments, be they community or ecology, via means of lifestyle, while, con while they continue to expose the ex evils of greed and promote human values and rights. What is of interest to me is that in the past, such acti activism, which challenged the status quo, was met by resistance by est the establishment. Today, instead, government and cultural institutions seem to seek to use the artist activists' endeavors as a way to generate new creative, non-confrontational approaches to issues arising from our, that is to say, corporate capitals, urban and economic crises, which has resulted in the dissolution of social and cultural bonds due to global migration and markets. As a source of, of social good, our thinking about art remains implicitly committed to the enlightenment principles of self-improvement and self-realization through self-awareness. Problematically, the goal of this process, good, whatever that might mean contextually, is thought to be always already known in that it is socially supplied to us via notions of self-determination and comfort. As such, we know what we relatively want, peace, security, plenty, choice. After all, that is what has been promised to us. And given we have for the most part been cut out of the political process, we, are, we now seem to believe we might, ha might be able to have our own individual political effect by cultural means. As such, in this age of the privatization of the public spaces, we find ourselves now free to build our own Trojan horses. Social practices as art reflect, reflects an instrumental logic in that it reflects the belief that art must be utilitarian, that is, immediately useful. This implies that art needs to justify itself, and as such, given present conditions, one such way is to explicitly turn it into a social apparatus, perhaps a means to promote equity. As such, art is reimagined as a laboratory for ideals, which cannot be achieved in the real world, but instead are forever promised, contained, and deferred. From this cynical perspective, and at its worst, social practices gives us little more than the living dead, who reenact the freedom to reenact their freedom. Have you noticed that the rich and the powerful are seldom portrayed as zombies? These and still other considerations leave me wondering about the unexplored ideological assumptions that underlie the convictions on the, on the part of both artists and audience, which supports the belief that an institutionally embedded art practice would be capable of making us collectively aware of the detrimental effects that the unstated presuppositions, assumptions, and habits that define the shadow realm of our being play in regimentation and spiritualization of our daily lives, our routines. Or how such practices can contribute to the reorganization of everyday life, or worldview, or social pr proprieties. Inversely, this leads me to wondering if social practices as art and culture as politics might not be a symptom of the very conditions it would like to address. Given these concerns and a myriad, a myriad of others as yet unstated, along with Walter Benjamin's maxim concerning how fascism 
aestheticizes politics. I decided to invite you and the panelists all here tonight in the hopes that you would be able to help me think through the pros and cons as to whether social practices would be ha have greater cultural and social impact if the golden umbilical cord that tethers it to art were to be cut. As a practice, might it now have matured enough to leave its parents home? So in part, to start this discussion off, I set before the panelists the simple question, are emergent social practices best served by continuing to associate themselves theoretically and institutionally with the practice of art? This is more or less what I distributed to the panelists. This is more or less what they will be responding to. Because it, because it seemed best that first you know who they are and what they do before they, they put forth their views. They've been invited to do five minute self introductions. The first, the first panelist to, you'll hear from is Sarah Riesman, who is the director of New York City's Percent for Art program and that commissions permanent public artworks for newly constructed and renovated city-owned spaces indoors and out. Riesman has also curated more than 40 exhibitions and projects for numerous institutions, not-for-profits, and other art spaces. You'll then hear from Damon Rich, who is a designer and artist and the founder of the Center for the Urban Pedagogy and Artists in Residence for the Newark Waterfront. That will be followed by Maureen Connor, who is a professor at art, of art at Queens College, CUNY, and since 1990, she is also the co-director of the pilot MFA in Art and Social Practices in collaboration with the Queens Museum of Art. And then finally from Stephen Duncan, who's an associate professor at Gallatin School and, and the Department of Media, Culture, and Communications of New York University, where he teaches the history and politics of media. So thank you. I'm now going to turn it over to Sarah. So it's great to be here in conversation with um, this group of panelists, who all of whom I I know fairly well, and I guess um, Stephen Duncombe the least, but I've seen him speak, and um, it's exciting to try to address this question, does it need to be called art? Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Percent for Art, which I'm going to introduce this as my self-introduction, even though I do other things. Um, and I think it's useful because it um, is legislated public art. Um, so. What you're seeing on the screen is um, a page of leg legislation that outlines how the Percent for Art program needs to be carried out. Um, it's a program that is based on this 1% model that any city-owned construction project on city-owned property that has public access in some way or delivers public services um, is required by law to incorporate 1% of its construction budget, dedicate 1% of its construction budget to art, permanent art. So. Since 1982, when the law was passed, um, there have been 300 projects commissioned and completed. Um, currently, there are about 80 underway in all five boroughs. Um, and they're in places like courthouses, plazas, streetscapes, parks, public schools, um, water pollution control plants, police and fire facilities. So they're in places that I think a lot of the contemporary art world doesn't necessarily go. Of course, we see artwork on streets, but usually when people ask me, what it is I do, they assume I'm like working with the Public Art Fund. It's sort of temporary work seems to register more. So here's um, just a snapshot of a process that can take anywhere from one to 10 or 20 years to commission an artwork. So I'm just gonna let you meditate on this for about five seconds because I only have four more minutes. Um, but it's a really, uh, this is procedural public art at its finest. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, and this is dictated by the law. So there's not a lot of room for saying, you know, we're gonna skip that part and just move on to the next phase and I'll just pick that artist. So very quickly, I'm gonna show you 
a bunch of images of recently completed projects. Um, this is an artwork by Diana Cooper called Out of the Corner of My Eye. And this was for um, Jerome Parker Campus in Staten Island, ISHS 43. Um, I'll give you some anecdotes because I think it's interesting to think about the impact of these artworks on the people who use these civic sites. When Diana was finishing the artwork, she told me that a student came up to her and said, it's just too beautiful, which is kind of um, hard to take, right? Um, and this was one of the first pure installation projects done in a public school. This next artwork is Sarah Z, Momentum and Its Conservation, completed in 2011. And it was, um, it's at Mott Haven campus, which is several schools combined. Um, so you see that there's this um, hanging sculpture and then terrazzo floor reflection of the artwork. Here are a couple other views. So it's made mostly of school supplies. And this is from below. Here we have Ben Rubin's artwork for the public theater, which was just finished um, this fall. It's an artwork that, um, it's, it's a, a logical algorithm that processes all of the text of Shakespeare into these different kind of word plays. So here we have a listing, it's, it's an LED display chandelier with 37 panels. Each panel is feeding from one play. Shakespeare wrote 37 plays. Um, and the logical algorithm, the idea is that you could come into the theater and see here's logical algorithm that is verb plus it from all of the plays. So it's this poetry that scrolls across the screens um, continuously. And one of the things that's nice about this public theater renovation is that it was designed to make it more public so that when you approach it, it's open. Um, so this is something you can see pretty much any evening. Um, this is an artwork by Tat Futan called the SOS Pledge. And this is a piece that touches the most on social practice, I think, in the sense that Tat Futan has worked on this principle of be being a sustainable organic steward, an SOS. So here he is in his SOS scouts uniform, standing in front of the pledge. It's for PS 971 in Brooklyn. Um, <coughs> It's a, a marble curtain wall with gold leaf lettering. And as you can see, it's a pledge that students can read or not read every day of their you know, school years. Um, I hereby pledge to make the following changes in my life. My actions will be small, but their collective impact will be great. One of the things that was great about this project, which isn't apparent in the finished work, is that he had extra funding. His budget might have been $100,000. So he was able to take the funding and do workshops with students for the next year. Um, teaching them about sustainability, um, different kind of practices that contribute to being an SOS. Um, there are a few projects we've done at water pollution control plants. So this is Vito Conchi's The Edge of the Plant, The Edge of the Neighborhood, which is a sculptural fountain. So Newtown Creek Water Pollution Control Plant is in Greenpoint, and um, <coughs> at the time when it was being constructed, obviously the community had a reaction to it, so as part of the visitor center, there's this sculptural artwork by Vito that cuts across the, cuts through the facade of the, the building, which is a place where you can find out what happens at this water pollution control plant. So here's some other views inside the space, looking down. This was at a ribbon cutting. So you see the, the podium there. Um, this is an artwork by Sanford Biggers called Lotus uh, from 2010 at Eagle Academy in the Bronx. Um, it's uh, Lotus made from uh, maps of slave ships for a school that was founded by a group called 100 Black Men. And then I'm gonna quickly go through some projects that um, are part of New York City's uh, public plaza program launched by the Department of Transportation about four or five years ago. And there are five artists that present for arts commissioning within that. And this, you're looking at a proposal by Ellen Harvey called Mathematical Star. Um, and it's a mosaic proposed for a, um, a street corner in Brooklyn. It's an area of unused road space that a local community group well, they're not such a community group. They're a development corporation called, um, is it rent? No. Restoration, sorry. So Restoration um, proposed to turn this unused road space into a plaza. Ellen proposes Mathematical Star, which it's a quilt design, and it's being turned into a mosaic. And her idea was to draw from architectural elements in the community that locations identified by community members that could be brought back into the design um, and then you have this kind of secret history of the community. Zhu Bing is another artist we're working with on the Plaza program, and he produced, or he's proposed this artwork called Writings um, at Helen Temple. And it's uh, based on a text, a poem by um, Li Shei, who was a ninth century poet. Only a few of his poems remain. And um, 
Jubing has pr produced these kind of renderings of seating at um, Forsyth Plaza, which is adjacent to the Manhattan Bridge. It will be um, in about two years. So here you have another view. And the idea is these benches, all of them, have a text using his square word calligraphy, which is a kind of signature work that he does. Um, and if you were to look closely at the Chinese lettering, um, there's actually a message embedded in it, um, which says, by a bamboo temple I, t I talk with the monk along the way, half a day in my floating life is thus wild away. Um, so I'm gonna end there, and just something contemplative and not so functional. Or maybe it's both contemplative and functional, <laughs> it's a bench. But anyway, that's, that's percent for art in a snapshot, and um, I think I'll move to Damon's presentation. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Hello, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Damon. Uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, it's good to see some friends from Newark here uh, to keep me honest. Uh, in response to uh, the question that Saul put out there, I uh, really thought, like, man, like, I'm confused too. Um, so I thought what I could do is share a couple things that I've had the opportunity to work on in different institutional contexts, and maybe um, this discussion can help me sort it out a little bit. Uh, I appreciated Saul's words at the beginning, although I gotta say I wish I was the artist in residence of the Newark Riverfront. Maybe I'm gonna take that title from now on. Um, I gotta tell you, and, and this will come out in the presentation, that um, my day job is being a straight up bureaucrat. Uh, I am the chief urban designer for the city where I live and work, Newark, New Jersey. Um, that means it's the office where you gotta go if you want permission to build anything in the city. And if you have beef with anything that people wanna build, it's the place where you go to. So we are literally the bureaucrats trying to hold out the public space in the middle there. So what I'm gonna do uh, for these five minutes, I thought, is to quickly, in 20 seconds, show you just a bunch of stuff that comes from different contexts. I'm not gonna say anything. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about one project in particular uh, that was kind of recent. Um, so these are all things uh, that I've gotten to make. All right, so that's just some stuff. Um, for this time, and I think for the next time, I'm gonna try to talk about three particular projects in particular contexts that all, at least for me, hold a certain lesson. So lesson number one is your museum needs a community organizer. Uh, this is a project I got to do at the Queens Museum of Art in 2009, uh, just as the financial world was melting around us. It felt like chasing the apocalypse. This was a project and a series of larger scale installations that I've done that looks at all the things that plug into buildings that make the rules for buildings. And so this one was about money and buildings. When you walked into the exhibit, the first thing that you saw, have people been to the panorama of New York City at the Queens Museum? Oh, you gotta check it out. It is one of the biggest architecture models in the world is of all of New York City. So when you walked into our exhibition, um, you saw the, the model and you saw these strange markers on it. Um, and we placed those markers on every single block in New York City that had had three or more foreclosure filings in 2008, which was the year before the show. 
Um, so you could see both the individual instances of this kind of abstract sounding problem, um, but you also could see its distribution across the city, which if you followed the news for the last four years, I would hope that you would know is by no means evenly spread, right? Um, this thing hits in particular areas marked by particular class and race characteristics for the most part. From the model, you then went into a space that tried to take all kinds of small scraps of reality that I had found through lots of wandering through the world and talking to people and videotaping and photographing and Xeroxing uh, that tried to somehow embody and instantiate these abstract forces of finance in different ways. Every thing in there was kind of like a different kind of failed thought experiment. Um, there were drawings that tried to imagine tubes going in and out of things that had to do with different regimes of the political control of the market for buildings. Um, there was a big sculpture, this thing in the foreground, that was a, actually just a, a built out graph in kind of a super stupid way of interest rates over the last 100 years. Um, the head in the background is a man who wrote the first book on real estate appraisals. So you can go in there and kind of figure out who he is. Um, these are all buildings from different parts of the metropolitan area of Detroit that were arranged geographically, so you can kind of walk across 120 miles uh, in the space of the gallery. Um, you could learn about different places, like the buildings that we build to take care of the records of who owns buildings and who owned it before. Um, you could understand the chain of title a little bit in this funny sculpture um, that talked about how power runs through the financial connections that go into buildings such that that's a little piece of Newark right there. All those buildings in red are bank owned as of the time of this exhibit. Um, you could meet a lot of crazy cats that I got to meet uh, who work in areas of finance and real estate from bank regulators to this guy whose name I can't believe it, but it really is Shecky Schechner, who says <laughs> that he invented the commercial mortgage-backed security when he was working at Goldman. He's now at Chase. Um, and also you could learn about some historic narratives in terms of communities that had some problems with the way that the system of finance for buildings ran and then fought in all kinds of amusing ways to try to change it. Um, so for example, this Xerox of a report and this photograph of the 1972 National Conference of American Neighborhoods, which was the first kind of, it sounds like a social practice event, but Lord knows it was not, and I don't think it, <laughs> it would have worked if it was, um, where people came together to talk about things like redlining and disinvestment in their neighborhoods, and eventually it led to the passage of things like the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and the Community Reinvestment Act, which in their basics make visible some of these dynamics in ways that um, I would love it for you to look up later. Um, there were videos made uh, that worked with popular education campaigns. This is from Lawrence, Massachusetts, epicenter of foreclosure, uh, where people who had actually been through these like horrible victimizing scams from contractors, loan brokers, et cetera, acted out their um, stories with puppets, of course, not of course, but after really not being cool with appearing on camera for understandable reasons. Um, and then finally for this project, it was important that it be more than a sandbox because for me, I couldn't make this work without like calling on a lot of people's time to help me understand issues, to do interviews with me, to send me their brochures, et cetera. So we wanted to somehow get this into the bloodstream of those issues. So this is, goes back to the moral. The Queens Museum is the only museum I've ever worked with that has a community organizer on staff. And because of that, that community organizer called about 200 housing related organizations in New York and said, hello, I'm calling from the Queens Museum of Art. <laughs> and then persisted through people being like, I don't have time to talk to you. There's nothing a museum of art can do for me. And got them to come to a party where we had free drinks for all housing advocates. That then led to other events like being invited to go um, into neighborhoods that were highly impacted by foreclosure crisis. Uh, bringing together groups that say work with tenants and groups that work with homeowners, if you know the issue, uh, those don't collide very often, um, for bigger discussions and then also the provision of individual services, uh, advice around loans or mortgage situations. Um, and then the thing had some lift through media. Um, one of the best things was there was a McNeil Lair Hour, or whatever they call it now on PBS, session where they talked about the foreclosure crisis and they filmed the whole thing in the exhibit and they never mentioned it was an art exhibit. Horrible for my career, but kind of amazing that this thing was just a useful thing for them to understand this 
horrible drama that was going on in the world. So even though I was the artist in this situation, of, it was impossible without a whole stew of institutions and organizations that were sewn together by money and other things. So that's context number one. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maureen Connor. And um, I, I'm going to uh, probably incorporate my feelings about Saul's questions a little bit now rather than wait till later, um, just by nature of uh, what I'm going to show you. Um, and I hope it's uh, going to work out OK, um, because I'm, I'm going to start and stop a couple of videos. Uh, and in between the two videos, I'm going to show you some stills. So uh, the first piece I'm going to show is actually from a series. It's called Personnel. And it started, it's a project that started um, more than 10 years ago when I was about to do a museum show and found out that everybody in all of, all of the staff at the museum was, uh, actually it was the same museum that Damon did his work at, uh, only it was, what, about 10 years or, or nine years earlier. And a, a different, well, some of the same staff, but a different director. And that director was uh, kind of driving everybody out. So I realized this isn't going to go well. So instead of doing one of the projects I was planning to do, I decided to do a project where I would ask the staff if there was any way that I could help them. And basically, I didn't have much to offer. Um, I had a little bit of money and a lot of a fair amount of space. And the space that I had to offer was not space that was normally available to them. So um, I asked, how could how can I help you with my space? Got a lot of information. Um, tried to make a piece that was you know, dealing with these issues that they brought up, the problems that they had, which had to do with privacy and um, a lack of places to gather. And it was ultimately a huge failure because the director of the museum wouldn't, in the end, allow anybody to use it. So uh, I had a number of small buildings that, uh, kind of sheds that people could use for different purposes. and. Um, so school children came in and loved it. So that was, you know. <laughs> but otherwise, so I'm going to show you, uh, I'm not going to show you that piece, but some other pieces that I had the opportunity to do since then, uh, continuing the project of exploring uh, the staff of art institutions and thinking of myself, going in there and thinking of myself as a kind of alternative workplace consultant, but somebody who represents the, the staff, the workers, and, and not management, and not the bottom line, which is what uh, workplace consultants usually are representing, but rather trying to make things better for the staff. Uh, so anyway, I'll just show you that. stop it there for a moment. Um, so they had a big storage problem, as was explained. Um, the, the, but the other problem was that everybody did the job, basically two and a half people. 
the Todd Pius Museum was a museum, well, Bar this was sort of, it, this was like 2002. Barcelona was, you know, in the middle of its, you know, huge buildup of um, being the center of, of uh, neoliberal tourism. And the Tapias Museum wasn't as uh, user-friendly as a lot of the other museums. So it seemed like everybody on the staff had to become part of the education process. So when I thought about making the work, I was thinking on the one hand, OK, they can carry their stuff around with them because they don't have any place to store it that's available and convenient. But at the same time, I saw them as carrying, everybody was carrying like too heavy of a load. So that was why, also why, and obviously there's a reference to, um, to uh, Velasquez. Then the water storage was also inaccessible. So basically, every time they wanted to get um, paper towels or a bottle of water or some coffee, they had to go through the office of the chief financial officer. So when I first came in to do the project, he kind of took me aside and said, please, can you please help me? Uh, so that's what I ended up doing. But this piece, uh, which was what I ended up calling well, was 365 bottles of water uh, that were hung from uh, a cupola that went all the way through the museum down, down five stories. And the offices were on the top floor of the fifth story. So the idea, the hope was that the staff would be able to pull the bottles up as if they were you know, going to the well. But this is another problem with doing projects in museums. The staff, museum staff is trained not to touch anything and not to interact with anything. So those 365 bottles stayed there for five months and nobody, nobody used one of them. I did understand because it was a very uh, complicated, difficult installation to get them all at the right height and properly spaced. But the whole I idea originally was that they would, you know, they would disappear. So they didn't. Canadian Museum uh, that had a very adversarial upstairs downstairs situation so the uh, management the curators and directors uh, and administrators ha were kind of in conflict a lot with the people who were uh, the installers and even the education department so I got everybody to dress up uh, for three days the first day they were meant to wear formal clothes. So I got a shop to supply the clothing, a local shop. And uh, so men were wearing tuxedos or suits, and women were wearing formal dresses, cocktail dresses, all supplied by these shops. I gave them the option to cross-dress, but nobody <laughs> actually did. Um, so uh, it, this is one of these things that Saul mentions about documentation that the documentation, what I have to show, really doesn't give you any sense of what it was actually like there. The, it, it was amazing that when people were dressed up, suddenly they behaved like different people. They were nice to each other. They were polite. They were almost courtly, holding doors and, and uh, you know, really 
being very pleasant. And the next day, I had them wear pajamas. And when they wore pajamas, they were completely relaxed. Um, and so the, the, the whole experience was only really available to the, the group there and also public that might have come in because uh, they, the, the guards were dressed up and so were the um, people in the store, the, you know, the museum shop and the cafe. So the public had, had some sense of it, uh, but it was something that you know, can't really be documented even, you know, certainly not in these short videos and, uh, and not uh, even, I think, in a long documentary. Okay, this is a project um, from the collective that I started in, uh, in 2008 called the Institute for Wishful Thinking. And the Institute for Wishful Thinking also addresses behind the scenes people. In fact, the first project we did was for uh, a biennial in uh, Iași, Romania. And we addressed the needs of the staff of the biennial. But the difference between Institute for Wishful Thinking's process and personnel's process is that uh, Institute for Wishful Thinking asks for wishes. They don't go in. One of the problems that happened, would happen to me was I would get sometimes defensive reactions from staff because I would start asking questions, not in a negative sense, but just from the perspective of, well, in your workplace, after I would get their job description, I would ask, in your workplace, what aspects of the space works and what aspects don't work? And even just asking that question would sometimes make people feel like, well, I'm, I'm looking for problems, I'm, especially the administrators and the directors. I think I was looking for problems, and they would get very upset. So um, the Institute for Wishful Thinking was taking a different approach. Rather than coming in asking for problems, we come in and we ask for wishes. So people could express their problems through their wishes and um, or, or also hide them. So we would ask for wishes also that were outrageous, but we could also ask for wishes that were anonymous. Um, but I just want to show this one pro project, uh, which was subsequent to the biennial in Yash, and it's, um, it's called the SOS Peace Pentagon. So it's another SOS piece. Uh, and it was a proposal for a contest, uh, um, a competition that was held by the Peace Pentagon, which is a, a building on the corner of Lafayette and Bleecker that houses the War Resisters League, which is the oldest anti-war organization in, in the US, plus a number of other uh, very old, or, or maybe not so old, but since uh, been operation since many of them since the 60s of nonprofits. Uh, so the building was falling apart. It had been bought in the, in the mid 60s by the War Resisters League when they were evicted from their space on Fulton Street right after um, Daniel Ells Ellsberg uh, showed the uh, Pentagon Papers in the New York Times, and the War Resisters League was broken into by the FBI. So the landlord didn't want the, the FBI breaking into his building, so th they got evicted. So they wanted to get a building where they would be safe, where they wouldn't have this kind of thing, a building that they owned, and also uh, that they could afford that would be affordable. So the problem with the fact that it was an affordable building, which it was from 1966 until the present. They kept the rents very low, but they also, as a result of the, of the rents, didn't have enough money to keep the building very well maintained. So in 2009, the building basically was falling into the ground. It had a huge crack. So they uh, it organized this competition so that uh, there would be a winner, but it was a very small honorarium for the winner, but they hoped that it would call attention to the building and help them to raise money. So the, the building, you, you could either do a renovation or you could do something completely new. So uh, what we did was to propose a ship which would, was rescued from something called sh shipbreaking, which is probably one of the worst results of globalization that has happened that, that in, in the whole world. Uh, it is where ships used to be um, when they were when they were no longer seaworthy. They would be taken to dry dock and taken apart, and the metal and, and other materials would be sold for scrap. It was not a very lucrative thing. But with globalization, 
ships were repurposed and repurposed and repurposed until they were barely seaworthy. And when they were finally really couldn't limp along any further, they would be rammed up on the beaches of India or Bangladesh, at which point teenagers would come out with screwdrivers to take them apart. Um, and so there was a, a, a terrible um, history of, okay, all right, I'm done. Um, there was a terrible history of um, children being killed and maimed as a result of this. So, uh, so our proposal was rescue a ship from shipbreaking, and that would represent uh, this ship of fools, which was still uh, surviving somehow at the corner of Bleecker uh, and Lafayette in the middle of all the gentrification, and bring over uh, the, some of the, the workers from Bangladesh and have them trained in safe practices by um, American out-of-work shipbuilders. So I'll stop it there. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Stephen Duncan, um, and I feel somehow naked that I have nothing next to me. Um, but in any case, um, I want to take on this whole idea of social practice art and what it's good for, sort of head on. And so I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to just be very brief about what I do and then segue into my commentary. And then when I move over there, I'm not going to say anything. Okay, um, so this is how it's going to go. So in any case, um, about 15 years ago, there was a really fine collection of essays on art and activism by Nina Felschen, who some of you may have read. Um, and its title was, But Is It Art? Um, and I actually want to kind of pick up on the same theme, but explore it from what I think is an underdeveloped perspective and asking a different question of activist art or social practice art. And the question I want to ask is, but does it work? Um, now, I'm not an artist. Um, I did attend art school, only to discover that I had very little artistic talent. Um, and as, as Saul pointed out, I am a professor. But my other life, um, a life that's lasted longer than being a professor, is um, I've been an activist since I was about 17 years old. And I'm an activist who's used art as an integral part of my activism for many years with Lower East Side Collective, with Reclaim the Streets, Bin Billionaires for Bush, the clandestine insurgent rebel clown army, and scores of other political groups. Um, and what me and my friends, my comrades would do is we employed the arts, mainly performance, but also the graphic arts, as a way to speak to a public that usually turns off at the first sign of political preaching, uh, to grab a few minutes of attention from a blase mass media, and to entertain our fellow protesters. Um, even the converted need something to keep them going. Um, and for the past few years, I've been working with um, an actually quite talented artist named Steve Lambert. And we've created something called the Center for Artistic Activism, which is a 501c3. And we do research. We have a user-generated database of activist art examples called Actopedia with the Yes Labs. Um, but our two biggest projects are, one, the School for Creative Activism, in which we go around the country, um, New York, Boston, Austin, Houston, rural North Carolina, um, Washington, D.C., and actually in the future, we're going to Nairobi in Moscow. And we train grassroots artists, um, activists, I'm sorry, we train grassroots activists to think a little bit more like artists. Um, we also have a sort of sister project called the Arts Action Academy, in which we kind of flip it over, and we actually train artists to think a little bit more like activists, um, in the hopes that the combining of these two practices makes for an effective um, political practice or social practice. Um, and we're actually really good at what we do. We're very successful. Um, you know, we built a network of alumni. We're in demand. And I put successful. There's little quotes around that. Um, because we're also funded. We get funded by George Soros. And we get asked to speak at institutions and things like that, the very things that I think Saul was calling into question. And I think it's right to call that into question. Because through all these endeavors, whether as a street-level activist or now a trainer of activists as I am, there's a question that haunts me, which is, how do we know if what we're doing is actually effective? 
Indeed, how does any social practice artist or artistic activist or artivist know when she's successful? And how do we even begin to think about such a question? Now, in the mainstream arts world, there's actually much clearer criteria for success. That is, you have commercial success, which is gauged in terms of the prices fetched for a piece of work of art, attendance at, or length of run of show, or what have you. There's also institutional success, approval by critics and peers, grants received, institutional support, and so on and so forth. But how do you gauge success for art that seeks to change the world? This is a little bit trickier. So now I'm going to do the segue into my commentary. Um, what's our criteria for good activist art? And that's what I want to explore right now. And I really mean explore. Because I don't think it's helpful to come up with a definitive definition of what is and what is not political art. I think that way leads to lots of performances and portraits of burly armed workers on tractors and the glories of forced collectivization. <laughs> um, but I do think it's helpful, indeed necessary, for those of us who think of ourselves as activist artists to seriously think about what this means and how we might do it better. In other words, I'm arguing for a metrics of success, but this is a very key part, our own metrics of success. So think of this as a bit of a thought experiment because it's all very speculative. So the first and probably most important step in this experiment is explore the different ways in which art might have an effect on power and politics. In other words, it's asking the question, what sort of a political impact do we as artists actually want or expect to have? And I've come up with a handful of answers. There's no one answer, um, but I'm going to run through a couple. One is, do we want a direct material result? Do we want policy change, election results? Um, do we want a direct ideological change? Do we want to change social opinion, public opinion? Do we want a long-term ideological shift that is not necessarily change how things are in the short run, but over a long run, a new vision of the future, a sort of positive ideological shift, or perhaps a negative ideological shift in terms of a new critique of the present that would take place over years at a time? Extending this a little bit, and this is another criteria, do we want to do what Jacques Rancière, the French philosopher, calls a redistribution of the sensible? That is, essentially change language, vision, our very sense of what is in and outside of the sensible, of what is politics itself. That is, fundamentally change our framework for understanding the world. Is that what we're trying to do? Are we trying to transform experience? That is, reconfigure spaces to alter experiences or rearticulate bodily practices. Are we trying to create countercultures? That is, building countercultures, practices, beliefs within a dominant society, creating havens within the heartless world, if you will. Are we trying to preach to the converted? As I said, the converted needs something to do as well. That is, education and entertainment of a movement or a counterculture already in existence. Um, are we interested in experimentation? Experimenting with new languages, visions, and experiences to see what happens. That is, have no clear criteria of what the outcome is, but the experimentation itself we see as having some sort of social impact. Where the outcome is undetermined, and what doesn't work is just as valuable as what does work. Or maybe we're interested in making art that doesn't work at all. I was once giving a talk about this, and a woman came up after me and she said, it's all very interesting what you're saying, but I want my work to do nothing at all. <laughs> I think the problem is the excess instrumentality of artwork and the excess instrumentality of our society, and I want art that's useless. To which my response was, great, let's make it the most useless art possible. How are you going to do that? <laughs> the key here is not to say that there's one criteria of success or another. It's to have a very clear idea of what you want to have happen with your artwork and what the artist or the social practice artist expects to have happen and then think about how we might make that happen. And very importantly, how does one measure if that has happened? How do we build milestones in order to determine are we moving in the right direction or are we moving in the wrong direction? So anyway, these goals, of course, are frequently complementary. For example, as we live in a democracy where public opinion, opinion matters a great deal, ideological change and material change are often linked. And one goal may fail while another may succeed. For instance, you may fail to sway public opinion in the short run, 
only to discover that your work has set into motion a sea change of thought that only bears fruit years later. Conversely, an immediate shift in public opinion may be a flash in the pan and its effects would dissolve over time as the idea or vision is co-opted back into the dominant system. So in other words, the goals I've offered are not exhaustive and they're not mutually exclusive. But if you know what you're shooting for, then your aim becomes a lot truer. So once we've given serious thought to what political effect we're aiming for, it brings into focus other key factors that are useful in thinking about producing art for social change. The primary question being is, who's the audience and how do you reach them? If your goal is preaching to the converted, then the symbols you use, the language you speak within, has to resonate with an already persuaded audience in the alternative media through which they make sense of their world. If the task you've set for yourself is ideological change, then you need to consider what languages you might use that are already in use by a wide swath of the public, and what aesthetic choices might make your art conducive to being picked up and amplified by the mass media. If your goal is to have direct material impact, then the language and aesthetics of politicians and policymakers to either seduce or frighten them have to be addressed and so on. And if your hope is to change the distribution of the sensible, that is, blow people's minds, then you need to think about communicating in a language that very well may not be understood by any audience at all. That is, this is the, the old problem of the avant-garde, that is, legibility. So the next critical question, the last one I want to talk about, is how do you know if you've succeeded in reaching this audience and bringing about any change? Or to go back to my archery metaphor, how do we actually judge if we've hit the target? This seems to be an impossible task, which is usually why we ignore this, okay? One of the research um, things that we do at the center is we've interviewed political artists, about 25 to 30, with a very simple question. How do you know if it works? Um, the best response we actually got was from Hans Hacke, who said, it's gonna take me a long time to circumvent that question before I finally never answer it. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think that why he was so reluctant to answer it is because it's a very difficult question. Um, instead, we often opt to make our statement and hope that something happens, a sort of magical thinking that might be better suited to alchemy than to modern political strategy. Um, but once we've developed a way of thinking about what sorts of political effect we might have or want to have, I think we can begin to develop a methodology for gauging success. Now, some cases are obviously easier than others. For example, going back to this idea that your goal is direct material result, then the proof is in the pudding. That is, did it work? Did a policy or law get defeated or enacted? Was a politician elected or overthrown? Was a community garden saved or bulldozed? These are the types of things that if you put your art actually into a campaign and that campaign is interested in a direct material result, at the end of the day you can say, yeah, I think it actually did help this happen or perhaps it didn't help it enough. But this is sort of low-hanging fruit. What's far more complicated is these changes in consciousness, the ways of thinking, which I think actually art and arts are perhaps best suited to dealing with. That is, often the effects which we are looking to for and effects that the art we do produces may not be discernible, not in a short run or even our lifetimes. That is, mass changes in sense perception or bodily patterns, for instance. So how do you judge success here? And the answer is you, you might not be able to. And I think that's okay. And we need to make peace with that. The changing the world is a long, long, long project. And we shouldn't get to spirit if it doesn't happen overnight. My point here again is not that there's some sort of simple methodology for gauging efficacy, nor is it to privilege one approach or one criteria over another. One could even, as I outlined above, argue for making a political art that's against the ideal idea of political efficacy. The goal here, I think, and the challenge I want to put out to artists, particularly social practice artists and activists who use art in their work, is to think and think seriously about what we hope to accomplish. And by doing that, we start to develop a rigor in our practice that allows us to perhaps move closer to what our goal is. We may never reach that goal, 
sometimes that goal may be, like utopia, no real place. That is, nothing we're ever going to reach, but only a direction to move. But I think thinking about what do we want to do, who do we want to speak to, and how do we know if we've done what we've set out to do makes us more effective activists and makes us more effective artists. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, you really covered the waterfront there um, in terms of, of the, you know, of the big picture and then once we have the big picture, narrowing it down to uh, how we can actually make, determine what we want to make happen and how we might be able to do it. So, uh, bravo. Mm. Um, I, uh, my plan as, as, uh, as my response to, to Saul's questions at, at during this part was to uh, basically read to you the response of a group of artists, activists that I'm working with uh, in, a, in a kind of discussion group. All of us have been meeting since uh, early December, which isn't really very long, but we've been meeting every week. Uh, and we're putting together a, basically an a course which would be an introduction to social practice. Um, <clears throat> and it's a course that is everyone is who's in, a, in the core group, there's 15 people in the larger group and about six people who are actually teaching the course. I just started mine yesterday and everybody uh, else pretty much started in the last week or two. Uh, so some people have different specifics that they have to cover. So nobody is, is actually going to use the, precisely the same syllabus. Um, <clears throat> but we are playing with ideas. We're sharing a lot of different um, well, readings and exercises and uh, ways of approaching discussions. So when I got Saul's questions, I sent them out to everybody in the group. And um, so I'd like to tell you what responses I got. Um, first of all, everybody had the same reaction to the questions. They, they all thought that the questions set up the same old trap which is, you know, um, either it's, you know, political and then you want to put it out of the art world or it's art and it shouldn't be politics. Um, and I know it's much more complex than that and Saul's uh, introduction certainly spelled that out for us. But um, I, I thought it was very interesting um, that, that that was the, tr you know, that was the response. Um, so I'll just read you some of the different alternatives. Say, okay, don't go down that, don't go into that trap. Instead, you know. Into this trap. <laughs> <laughs> into the, yeah, into the non-trap trap. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, is there a trap, is there an entrapment in the non-trap direction? Uh, Mark Reed, um, raise a question of whether or how work benefits by being called art. Um, and he said, if the goal of social practice is radical social and political transformation. How does calling it art further that goal? And certainly both Saul um, and Stephen have touched on that, or more than touched on it. Um, so I'll just say what he said. Perhaps doing so gives an audience permission to engage in it in a more open way. Um, from a tactical culture standpoint, uh, there are actual advantages politically to calling things art. And this, again, speaks to uh, Stephen's idea of teaching activists to be artists, to behave more like artists. Um, <clears throat> but the question is not whether social practice is legitimate or even sincere, um, but uh, whether claiming the label of art is useful to what social practice wants to achieve. Uh, Susan Jehoda also raised some alternative questions instead of, that, that offered questions instead of Saul's questions. Um, how do we develop ethical practices that recognize, safeguard, and constitute our commonality? How can a productive change of ideas be initiated in the realms of art, science, 
civil society and education, an exchange that brings new ideas for environmentally sustainable living and incorporates them into everyone's everyday social practice. I mean, yeah, I think this, these questions are good because they take a totally different point of view than the usual art school questions that students are, you know, encouraged to look at and develop, you know, what do, what do they want to express? What is it that's very unique to them that they have to say? So this sort of takes, takes things out of that direction and places them, places the uh, priorities in a, different, in a different direction. Caroline Woolard um, offered a reality check. She said, most people I would call social practice artists do not function primarily in art institutions, do not focus on documentation over action and lived experience. Many of these artists want to work with publics that are not generally welcomed in art institutions. Uh, Scott Brasovsky, also, he was the second person to bring up trap, um, also wrote um, that the uh, artist activists trap reinforces a conservative defi definition of both positions. So the most conservative definition of an activist and the most conservative definition of an artist to create this dichotomy. Uh, he said that he also believes there are distinctions. For example, most activists work towards specific limited objectives, while artists tend to be motivated by more open, indeterminate outcomes. And he raised, uh, uh, the, or he brought up this quote by Pablo Hagueras, Education for Socially Engaged Art, <coughs> which I'm going to re read part of. The uncomfortable position of socially engaged art, <coughs> identified as art yet located between more conventional art forms and the related disciplines of sociology, politics, and the like, <coughs> we could add activism here, which he didn't, is exactly the position it should inhabit. The practice, the practice's direct links to and conflicts with both art and sociology, or activism, must be overtly declared and the tension addressed. But problems that normally belong to other disciplines, moving them temporarily into, a, moving, attached to subjects and problems that normally belong to other disciplines, moving them temporarily into a space of ambiguity. This, in, it is this temporary snatching away of subjects into the realm of art making that brings new insights to a particular problem or condition, and in turn makes it visible to other disciplines. Okay, so this is the hope. Now, you know, he's stating it as a fact. I would say that's the hope. Uh, Mark Reed wrote back that he loves the Hilgara quote, although he's wary because he thinks it affirms the role of artist as someone who doesn't take a clear position, someone with a commitment to ambiguity or worse, neutrality rather than a clear political uh, commitment, which he believes artists can and should make. Robert Sember also saw Trapp and suggested that it's neither necessary nor sufficient to call social practice art. So you don't have to call it art, but it's also not enough to call it art. However, calling it art brings into the mix a set of productive relationships some having to do with access to resources, others with a certain license to act in inventive ways, and some to acknowledge and draw from a lineage uh, for social action that can be inspiring and relevant. So it's not that we either call it art or we don't call it art. The name is in relation to a number of other processes. Perhaps it's not so much do we call it art as how we call it art, and that naming is in itself performative. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so Saul told Sarah and I that we could get the screen back and like ah. look at some stuff. Sorry about that. <laughs> so the curtain will. Uh, Would you mind going and they toggle for me? And I'll toggle the shoe. So as warned, uh, what I introduce myself with is all the art you're going to see from me tonight. Um, but what I thought I'd do now is uh, share some things that when I'm in control of my own biography, like I don't usually show at like art type events. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm confused. I used to have a professor who, who would say that she makes water, like pee, and she makes soup, but she does not make them in the same pot. <laughs> uh, 
and I usually stick to that, but I guess that here I'm kind of like, what is that in that pot again? <laughs> so, um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's it. So I'll go ahead and give the intro to this as it gets powered on up. Um, so I just want to give two other examples of strange and maybe interesting situations that I found myself in. Um, the first one is I had the chance uh, to found, with the help of a lot of other people, a nonprofit organization called CUP. And the focus of my work there, although it started off as being all about making things, designing things, eventually became the organization of collaborations. And so I wanted to share quickly one of the structures of collaboration that that organization now um, many years, five years after I left the full-time staff, continues to do in better and always uh, more interesting ways. Um, there's only a couple images for it, so I'll just explain it to you. Basically, the structure is um, a two-stage jury process. So this organization, CUP, uh, once a year puts out a call and says, hey, are you a neighborhood-based organization? Are you a policy advocate? Is there some complicated issue that you think it's really necessary to educate people about, to have them understand it, whether it's like hydro fracking or the social security system and what George Bush wants to do to it back in the day or what have you. Um, send in your ideas and uh, if you win, if you're one of four winners picked by a jury that's half designers and half um, policy or advocacy folks, um, then you'll get $1,000. You'll get to work with an artist or a graphic designer for free You'll get to work with CUP staff who make sure that everybody's speaking the same language, which is not an easy task, uh, and you'll get a thousand bucks. So they pick four, then we re-advertise those to artists and designer types. And we take their portfolios and their ideas about how they might address one of these four topics. And once we select um, these teams, again, which is CUP staff, a designer or an artist, and an, an advocacy partner, they work for like an excruciatingly long period, like 12 months. And the format's always the same. Um, it's a fold out uh, poster that's like 30 by 20 inches uh, when it's done. So if you all want to turn around, yeah. join me. Welcome to the show. <laughs> um, so the theme of this is making policy public. Again, first one was your museum needs a community organizer, especially if you're an artist. So, uh, oh, it's doing that blind thing, but whatever. Next on the show. You want me to fix it? Um, it's okay. okay. It's okay. As long as it doesn't annoy people. So this is that process I just described with the two stages of the jury. Um, now I'll show you some examples. So uh, the organizational partner involved here was a group called Tenants and Neighbors. They're a pretty hardcore statewide tenant advocacy organization. They were fighting an issue that they named themselves predatory equity. They came to us, me and Cup, said, look, we've done all this research. This is a really nasty issue, but it's crazy complicated. And what this was was at the top of the real estate boom, real estate speculators bought uh, rent-subsidized housing with the plan in like Sidetown, if you've heard about Sidetown, where they could squeeze a lot more rent out of it and pay back their creditors. Mm -hmm. Turns out, oops, housing crashed. That didn't work out. Mm -hmm. So what this t looks, about, looks at is, one, how people affected by this um, phenomenon, predatory equity, like, like private equity, um, can react to it, uh, and what might be some of the ways out of it. And there's been all kinds of discussions about how to deal with these affordable housing developments that are underwater. When people come to us, the number one question is, do you know your stuff, and do you know how to put this thing in the hands of the people that need it the most? Um, so this is them uh, debuting the poster, you know, starting their organizing campaign. It was hung in windows all across the city um, after that. Um, Another example was working with a union of street vendors. This is called the Street Vendor Project. They organized the Vendies, if anyone knows that, mm -hmm. the awards for the best food vendors. If you didn't know, that is a genius organizing and advocacy idea. It's not just a, a, a nice thing to go eat food. It's a way of legitimizing street vending. Um, most street vendors uh, make very low wages, about $12,000 a year. A great number of them are immigrants. So they wanted something that explained the rules about where you're allowed to street vend. No surprise, cops harass vendors. Tickets they give out can be up to $1,000, which is pretty serious trouble if you're making 12 grand a year. So interesting things come out of these design processes. So you can see this, this kind of has this like IKEA thing. It's in five languages, the five most common languages spoken. Again, 
I wouldn't know that as a designer. I didn't design this, by the way. Candy Chang was the designer here. Um, but this group did. Likewise, it was kind of a goofier look at first, and they were like, listen now, this thing has to look serious. So when we pull it out and show it to the cops, they don't think it's some like goofy comic book. They think <laughs> it's the law, which is what it is. Um, so again, Street Vendor Project distributed this to thousands of vendors. Now uh, the Midtown Court buys it because they deal with a lot of vending cases. So we think that it's done a small thing to kind of just increase the communication. Um, the last example from this I'll show was a collaboration with um, the Center for Court Innovation. They had a group called the Juvenile Justice Board that was a group of young people who had experience with the juvenile justice system that worked to find ways to improve it. What they said that they really wanted when they were um, locked up and going through the system was something that told them like what these lawyers were saying, what those words meant, what their actual choices were. So they worked with a graphic novelist, uh, uh, Danica Navordoff, I always struggle to say her name correctly, and that's what this thing does. It takes you through the experience of a kid who gets locked up for painting graffiti and the choices that are presented to him. You know, there's uh, lingo along the way. Um, today, the Department of Probation that runs the juvenile justice system in New York City, and they weren't a partner as this was being developed, um, gives out about 20,000 of these a year um, to kids who come into the system. Okay, so that's one example of something that certainly I think takes power from art and the tradition of making that we think of as art, but I, you know, I, I think certainly does not star me as an artist in any way. Um, last example, I want to take you to Newark for a second. Anybody here been to Newark? Besides the airport. <laughs> okay. um, some people. So I, I left out some of these slides, but since I now know that there's people here who want to talk about like social antagonism, um, Newark is a place uh, that has been a subject of conflict for a long time. You've probably heard of some of that. Um, many people, in fact, my friend Martha Rosler just the other day was saying that her belief was always that Newark was politically punished for its black and brown power movements. Newark elected the first African-American mayor of any large city on the East Coast in 1970. MLK went there two weeks before he was shot in Memphis in 68 and said it is a travesty that this place is still run by Italians. Um, so my job there, again, it's a bureaucrat in a planning office. Um, I'm gonna tell you about one small slice. It's the, it, it's the most enjoyable slice of the work I think I get to do in Newark maybe. Um, and it's about the riverfront. And this whole project, and I don't have the slides here to show you, is all about how can there be a different constituency that wants to talk about doing something with the public assets on Newark's riverfront that's not just downtown property owners who are not Newark residents, who make about 10 times as much as the median income in Newark and have, I would say, not always the same interests as the residents of Newark. So that was the question. Um, what is the riverfront that Newark wants? Um, some of the things that we got to do uh, was hang out with teenagers. Uh, I was new to town, I didn't really know my way around. I hung out with some teenagers who had grown up down the river, as they told me, mostly told by their grandmothers, uh, you know, stay away from there if you wanna stay out of trouble. Um, we went around, did things that architecture students do, made maps, took photographs. Um, people were excited to find things like dirty drawers and dead birds uh, <laughs> down at the water's edge. Um, we uh, went around, looked at maps, we interviewed people, environmental justice advocates, real estate developers, trying to understand the history of why the river was the way that it was. Um, in this process, just for me in a useful way, I got to meet groups that had been fighting against environmental injustice in Newark for decades and decades, who had had already established some kind of natural relationship to this place. They had had vigils and marches against, of course, all the bad things they didn't want, like dumps and incinerators, but also for the things they did want, like some kind of park along the river. Like, what a crazy idea. Um, so then with the kids, we started like thinking about our own visions, you know, wild stuff, like a roller coaster along the water's edge, on the boardwalk, or else uh, like a giant factory that just makes the smell of chocolate. <laughs> um, we then, and this is where the students, I have to say, became instrumentalized, because uh, mm -hmm. then we had a press conference, and we got our like somewhat celebrity mayor to come and cut the little ribbon on our little model of the way we thought the riverfront should look in the year 3000. Um, the press came, and this really became a way, and this is the instrumentalization, where the young people who did the project became the ambassadors to the entire city about the river. Um, this got installed in City Hall for about six months, and the thought is that it certainly distracted some people who came to pay their bills or get their birth certificate, 
um, and maybe you know led them to think about the riverfront for a couple seconds more than they had before. So then uh, we decided to make it bigger. And actually, the National Endowment for the Arts, so this is an interesting institutional thing, gave us money to start doing tours of the riverfront, um, of the Passaic River, the longest Superfund site uh, in the country, 17 miles. Um, we've taken, these are the posters, postcards that either I've gotten to design or my friends, Kevin Darmody did this one. Um, we've taken about 5,000 people out on the river the last four years. I love this woman's t-shirt. It's like a slogan for Newark. Haters make me famous. <laughs> um, we do walking tours, we go into people's businesses like steel fabricators, there's still a working waterfront in Newark, we hear from environmental remediators, um, and we just try to make this a place that's a part of the social life of what people in Newark do. Um, eventually, all these people said, hey, like we just don't want to go on fun things, Like we want to have a voice in decision making, so they wrote a, a statement of vision. Uh, for the future of the riverfront, which was the first time several of these groups, in addition to the one I mentioned, had actually actually worked together on this issue at all. Um, we then started having lots of meetings around designing parks and rezoning. I hope no one's had to deal with zoning, but I'm not going to talk about it now. But these are things that help people understand zoning that we use in block club meetings, church basements, whatever, trying to put the tools of the state at the service of the people who actually live in a place, not always that it happens, kind of explains different options. We talked about pros and cons from different people's perspective. Um, now we have a rezoning plan that changes the rules for what you can build on 250 acres of Newark's riverfront, and stations right there, um, that some of the developers are fighting us on, but we're, uh, I think, going to city council this year. Um, and then we're building things. Uh, so last year, we opened up the first piece of the riverfront park. This was made with some teenagers and me and Illustrator. Um, wrap it. A minute. Sure. Uh, so this opened up last summer. We had the first ever Newark uh, Walks to the Water. We had groups from all around the city uh, that uh, represented uh, youth organizations. We had the Malcolm X Shabazz Marching Band, a legendary band in the city of Newark that led the way two miles on a hot day from City Hall to the River's Edge. Um, we even got the mayor to make a YouTube video about it that I want to show you. <laughs> Um, and this is a big deal. Newark's a segregated city like most American cities. This park is in a Latino white area. Um, so to even have the Malcolm X Shabazz band lead the way led to some quizzical thoughts and then planning meetings. Um, but I think people in the end got it. Uh, these were some of the things that happened in the park from Ecuadorian dancing to drum circles to Portuguese people to good old fashioned double dutch. Um, you could learn about combined sewer overflow. You could see some old man's crazy Portuguese boat that he built. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, and since then, we've tried to have our own little revolutionary culture in the park. Um, yoga, Zumba, riverfront jazz, environmental justice storytelling. And even though I don't think we're quite there yet, um, we are now almost done with the second part of the park, which will have the first ever orange boardwalk, I think, in the state of New Jersey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Um, and then the final thing that I'm really excited about is the signage. And this is a piece I've gotten to really hands on. I'm working with a landscape architect on the park. And the signage tries to tell the stories of the park, the natural stories, the human stories, uh, and it kind of is all carved in the material of the park. So this railing that goes along that boardwalk that I just showed you, it's being fabricated now, talks about how sewers work over time and how they still overflow into the river. Talks about fish and birds, although they are eating dioxin. Uh, talks about some of the industrial history and, of course, um, unions and people that fought against unions. These are our prototypes of the materials. Uh, there'll be some funny national park signs. There'll be some signs made of logs that tell, again, industrial stories, stories about working conditions back in the day in the old Baalbach smelting plant that we had to pay $3 million to clean up to have a park. And then finally, at the river's edge, will be this railing that brings together a lot of the characters you meet in those other stories um, in a way that tries to, again, weave this place into the landscape and makes this place the riverfront um, that Newark wants. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So I think one of the, um, is this on? Yeah, one of the criticisms of social practice artists, just to bring it back um, to some of Saul's questions, is the idea of an artist taking up a practice that he or she's not trained to do. Um, and so for instance, that might be an activist. I mean, there is training to be an activist or expertise. Uh, social worker, historian, that kind of thing. Um, 
So can this be projected now? Okay. So I'm going to start with, with that premise, the idea that maybe an artist should be careful about what kind of role that he or she takes up. Um, I visited um, Portland State University's MFA program. Um, this image doesn't correspond to what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> back in 2011, um, Harold Fletcher, who's a social practice artist, developed an MFA program, and I met with graduate students, maybe 10 of them in a day, and gave a lecture and had many conversations. And one of their anxieties was, if we're doing things that um, stretch beyond our skill set, and maybe there's risk involved in administering, um, what would we call it, administering social work, um, different kinds of kind of human, human care that um, an artist may have a sensitivity to but isn't trained. But on the other hand, I think that it should be art to respond to the question. Social practice should be art because I think the ambiguity is important. I also think that a lot of the ideas that artists develop as artwork in the social sphere is kind of an incubation of an idea that then becomes bigger outside of the art sphere. So um, Michael Rakowitz is an artist. I'm going to hit on a few anecdotes from my history as a curator um, and people I encountered over the years whose work pointed towards social practice, but um, maybe the term wasn't in use yet. So around 2002, 2003, I was in the Whitney Independent Study Program as a curator and got to know Michael Rakowitz's artwork. So he made a piece called Parasite, which you see an example of it here. Do people know of this artwork? Probably some of you do. Um, he was a student at um, MIT and made a series of living structures for homeless individuals that he met in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So you can see here that, um, I mean, I feel like this is an old work to bring up, but it, it addresses this question of, is it useful, is it effective outside of art and all, or inside of art? So Michael Rakowitz built some number of these structures um, for individuals and then and they were used. Um, and the idea here is that there's a tube, a plastic tube that attaches to an outtake vent on a building. It inflates the structure. The person who it was made for lives in it and can also remove it quickly if they need to get going. So um, one of the things that happened with this piece was a few years later I was working at the ICA in Philadelphia, the Institute of Contemporary Art, and I was working with students at University of Pennsylvania, a curatorial studies course. They had seen Michael's work at um, Mass MoCA, this exact piece, wanted to include it in a show that they curated called Framing Exposure, Process, and Politics at the ICA, but felt that its installation in the museum space of Mass MoCA was limiting, so they opted to put it outside. <clears throat> and I think this is an interesting example because um, it was put outside, attached to an outtake vent at the ICA, and we had to put bricks in it to make it stay in place. Um, nobody ever got into it as far as I could tell. We would check it on, you know, every couple days. We had to tape it up a lot of times to make sure that it didn't just disintegrate. And what I realized is this is a piece that requires somebody live in it and that it doesn't belong in a kind of hybrid art public space, not, not in use. So I think this is an interesting example. I'll show you some work he did for Percent for Art. Um, it's a project called um, Secondary School and it's a series of vignettes that he's, um, he produced that document failures in, the his, in, in history that have been overlooked. Um, and the idea is that failure often leads to innovation. This is for a school called Midwood High School in Brooklyn, which, like a lot of New York City schools, has a theme, which is science and technology. So he took old desktops, uh, locker doors, chalkboards, and made these uh, vignettes that refer back to failures in the history of science and technology. So here we have Buckminster Fuller. It's a kind of drawing of trying to um, set up the first geodesic dome using blinds at Black Mountain College, and of course the story goes it didn't work. <laughs> um, but then you have next to it in the installation in the hallway of the school an image of Fuller standing in front of a realized dome. Another failure was, um, I'm not sure what year it was, but um, Heineken beer at one point was going to produce bottles that could be used as um, construction materials. They would interlock. Um, it was proposed. It didn't happen. It's a failure. But it's something that's worth students knowing about, right, um, as a way of freeing up your thinking. So this is an artwork that may not really even function as social practice, but it's this idea of changing one's mind. And as Stephen was saying, changing consciousness. I think that that, in a way, is art's greatest potential, whether it's social or not. <laughs> 
Um, in 2004, I co-curated a show with, five, I think, five other curators at Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. Um, it was a show called Jamaica Flux that's recurring and is organized by Hengel Hahn, who's been the curator there for many years. And <clears throat> one project, it was a series of installations along Jamaica Avenue that were meant to highlight the relationship between art and everyday life. So we used storefronts and a sidewalk, and um, there were certain mall spaces. Jamaica has a lot of malls, which wouldn't be obvious if you don't go there. So one of the artists in the exhibition, um, Laura Carton, proposed this piece called Model Citizen. But there was like a lead up to this project, which was, this was in 2004, which was a moment when um, we had a kind of important election. <laughs> so Laura's interest was, maybe I can do something about voter registration. So as she went around the community trying to scope out where she could stage her project, talking to people about how she could produce her project, she realized that a lot of people were afraid to talk to her because they were undocumented, they weren't here legally, and ultimately they wouldn't be able to vote. And it got her thinking about the idea of citizenship. So this model citizen piece is really simple. It was, I think she printed like 200 t-shirts with the word citizen on it and installed it adjacent to, outside of, within a store called Ross Roots Locks and Culture. And it's a hair braiding salon and a bookstore on one of the pedestrian malls in Jamaica, Queens. So Laura's piece um, on the opening day, it was really only active for about an hour. There was a sign attached to Ross Roots awning that said, are you a citizen? Get your free t-shirt here. And the agreement was it's free if you put it on. So people put on these shirts and suddenly there were about 40 people standing on the street or more wearing a shirt that said citizen. It seems simple, but what was interesting is suddenly people were talking about their relationship to United States citizenship, there were discussions about, I'm, a citizen, I'm not a citizen, but my children are. And so something about freeing up a conversation in public space, I think, was really interesting to see, even if very fleeting. The next artist I want to talk about along these lines of efficacy, I guess, is the, the point here, is Meryl Laterman Eucles. This is just an installation view from a show I curated called Condensations of the Social in 2010. Um, which is pretty much how Saul and I got to talking about social practice. Um, Meryl Eucles is um, an artist who people can call different things like feminist artist, performance artist, social practice artist, relational. Um, what you're seeing here are installation views of photos of her working with the Department of Sanitation where she was an artist in residence, it still is, since 1977. So she approached the sanitation department to, to do this residency and one of the first projects she did was to thank every sanitation worker for keeping New York City alive with a handshake. There were 8,500 of them. She did it over two years. So you see there are lots and lots of images. Um, but what's interesting about this project is here she is, this image here, made, it is kind of visible. She shadowed the sanitation worker. So she's not saying, I'm going to do this work in your place or performing it as if she really owned it. It was more about understanding it in order to make some kind of difference in how they, their, work, their working lives were experienced. So she, what, she would probably tell this if she were here, um, that one of the outcomes was the bathrooms at the sanitation department were too few and too crappy for the number of people who need, needed to use them during the half hour lunch break. So at some point she made a proposal to the commissioner of sanitation to get better bathrooms. So that's, that's that. I'll just show you a more recent project um, which is called Snow Ballet, Snow Workers Ballet in Japan, originally staged in 2003. Um, and here we have some of the participants, and she went back in 2012 to restage it, so it's using snow plows for a dance. Um, and, you know, the outcome of that is beauty, finding beauty in a kind of, um, I guess you'd call it like, a, you know, an industrial manual labor setting. Um, and then I'm going to, I think, end with an artwork by Mary Mattingly, who's an artist who some of you may have heard of. In 2009, she organized a piece called The Water Pod, and that's what this 80-foot long barge this, you know, on screen is. And it's living quarters for about five people at a time who lived on the barge for six months. Mary herself lived on it the whole time. Others came and went for different lengths of time, depending on the dynamics of those living on the barge. Um, and <coughs> they had a gray water purification system, a dry compost toilet, um, a, a vegetable garden, living quarters, 
Um, here's a view of where one would stay. I spent the night on the water pod, and I, I present this work because I know a lot of people were critical of this being something that had maybe been already hashed out in the 70s or earlier or later. Um, but the piece was, one of the key components was that the barge would dock um, at different locations on New York City's waterfront for two weeks at a time. That's the permit limit for docking without getting like a more elaborate permit, if that makes sense. So um, I had the chance to stay overnight um, when they were docked at the Bronx, uh, on the Bronx River next at a park called the Concrete Plant Park, which is kind of visible here. Um, <laughs> it's not an active concrete plant, but the weirdest part of this, here are the chickens. Um, here's breakfast. Um, you know, one of the things that would happen is people from the public would come and, part, you know, ask for some food, ask questions, learn about permaculture. Um, and it, I, to me, it, it was clear that it took a huge commitment on the part of this artist, Mary Mattingly, working with many people who contributed different things to the projects to realize this and demonstrate to a really wide public um, just how sustainability can be achieved in the city. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot um, for all the information. I, one of the reasons I came to this tonight, I'm interested in. Um, oh, there's mics. So. One of the reasons why I came to this and um, interested in the intersections between politics and art is I'm I'm trying to maybe shift more in an artistic direction, being frustrated by what uh, Insight is called the nonprofit industrial complex, <laughs> uh, which, which I feel is a similar issue uh, to the foundation work. And I'm wondering, possibly, in some ways, it seems that doing something with art is a, is a workaround to get funding to engage in political action to, um, without having to go through the, the liberalization of changing your mission to the funders. Um, but I don't know whether that's true, um, so I'd like to hear um, first, if people have had experiences, either personal or secondhand, of having to change their performance or their, their artwork to, to get the funding. Um, no such thing as clean money. No of course not. Um, <laughs> and also, just does, in terms of the question of calling it art, I mean, does moving, calling something art move it into the realm of the elite and thus remove it from the world of people who are actually trying to affect mm -hmm. change? And I've, a lot of questions. <laughs> um, can I respond to the last one? I mean, I think we yeah. showed examples, each of us, um, or three of us, that Damon and I in particular, where um, the audience isn't necessarily an elite audience. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with it, but when Meryl Eucalese was involved with thanking the sanitation workers for keeping the city alive and healthy, um, you know, that wasn't really for an audience. It was for this kind of core of workers working for the city. Um, but I, I actually want to address the question about funding because I don't think that calling what one does art makes you more lucrative to funders. <laughs> I think there's like a, to a dearth of art funding. I mean, per, uh, Percent for Art is New York City's only way of supporting artists directly. Um, and even so, it, there are lots and lots of strings attached that I don't, I mean, I don't know what you do, but I don't know that you'd want them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just want to speak to that last, the, fr the last part um, about does calling it art actually make it an elite practice? I, I would actually say if you call it art, perhaps, but if you think about it in terms of creativity, it's actually the, quite the opposite. And if you think about, I mean, one of the things, when we work with um, grassroots activists, most of them are relatively poor, um, almost entirely minority. Um, and are working with communities th that are, are likewise. Um, and it's those communities that actually have access to creativity in a way that they don't have access to legal, um, professional, um, political knowledge. Um, those are the things that they're locked out. Those are the things which are not them. So those are the things that the professionals do. But everybody knows someone who DJs on the weekend. Everybody who cooks dinner parties or everybody. So one of the works that we do is to get people to tap into their sort of creativity that they have in their everyday lives and say, how do you actually take that creativity and that creative experience you have and apply it to the political work that you do? Um, because we are all artists. Some of us get called artists and some of us get funded as artists. But creativity is something that, you know, some of the best creative things in this world have come from below. Many of them, actually, in terms of popular culture. 
Um, <coughs> uh, my question's more about, um, do you feel that if art isn't really practical in a public sense, that it might be overlooked by the general population? Do you have an example in mind? Uh, yes, some of the murals that I see down in lower Manhattan, uh, if you're not really looking for them, you can sometimes glaze over them and walk straight past them without ever actually realizing that they're there. Uh, actually, a pathway I've, I've walked for uh, some time now, I just realized there was a statue there that I just had never seen before, but apparently it's been there for years, so. Well, that's a problem with permanent public art, is that if it doesn't, if it's just there, you often don't see it. And if something's temporary and it's new and then it leaves, you kind of remember it in a different way. Um, but I don't think that it's necessarily overlooked. I mean, it depends how, how you move through public space, right? I mean, it's partly your consciousness and what you, what you, what you can receive you know, in a kind of everyday setting. Was that a sufficient answer? <laughs> Worked for of. me. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Going once? No, BB's no, down here. Down yeah. Uh, Mary's project mm -hmm. and Damon, your new work project. One is how long did the new work project take or how when did it start mm -hmm. up to now? And how did it get funded now that you mentioned that no money is clean money? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you make a living, <laughs> if I can ask that? <laughs> at, it seems like you're 24-7 advocating for all of these. How long did it take? How long did it take and how do you make it happen? I mean, I can tell you Mary Mattingly's project probably took two years of planning and then um, like six months of insane, constant 24-7 planning and the fun, I mean, the funding for that project dollar amount was $99,000. And I first met her at City Hall in a meeting. There used to be more of these meetings where a public proposal would come to the attention of City Hall, and you need, there need to be permits coordinated, right? So she came to City Hall, and I met with her, with a whole group of city agency stakeholders, and like Economic Development Corporation, Department of Environmental Conser Conservation, because of the waterways. And people from City Hall were shocked that it was only 99000 because of the waterfalls, which were 15 million, or something like that, right? So, and I said, well, this is a different model and a different economy. So, that's a that's a project that I think could have been funded much better, um, had it not been so DIY. And that's amazing because for the waterfalls, because not only did they have money to pay for the waterfalls themselves, but they paid HRNA, which is a financial advisory firm, to come up with a brochure that told told you how much more money they thought New York City made because of the $15 million, right? right. And that's yeah. a whole yes. industry yeah, 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 yeah. In, in of itself. You can, um, you can say that better than I can <laughs> over the city. There you go. Thank you. Um, that's why I'm from Newark. Right. Yeah. Uh, but to answer your question, um, you know, I mean, if you read, like, Bruno Latour, you'll know, like, these complicated public projects that have tons of stuff involved with them, like, Identifying a beginning is always like a fiction. Um, you know, the stuff I showed you started in 2009. Um, so it's, it, but you know, as I hopefully made really clear, like one of the main community-based organizations, the Ironbound Community Corporation, has been in the fight around the Passaic at least since 1983, when it was declared a super fun site and the largest collection of dioxin in the, in the known world. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that come together, and I think that's one of the things that's exciting to me, is that you know, these projects, you know, allow me to come in and not be like, hello, the artist has arrived, like mm -hmm. the project will now begin. Um, but actually, I think that for these projects to work, and this is where just in, in an operational day-to-day -day way, it makes a big difference to me. Um, th like, if there are artists around, their name almost has to disappear, right? Because mm -hmm. um, as soon as it's the idea of like some dude, or especially some white dude, it, when you're speaking in the context of Newark, it's like, not a good thing. Um, you know, it has to be something that's seen as more organic. And so that's about narrative and creation of representation, because nothing's you know, really organic when it comes to humans. Um, as far as the money goes, I mean, different money goes to different things. I mentioned the NEA. Uh, we've certainly gone out for some philanthropic, you know, prudential 
is like the big gorilla uh, funder in Newark, so we've gotten some money from them. But most of the money to build the parks you saw is public money. It's state money, so there's like special money. You know, there's 14 sources of money to build that only that second segment of park, which is about a $10 million job. Um, so there's a special 150 grand just for building boat infrastructure that's like sliced off of the licensing fees that boaters pay. So we got the 150 grand to buy a floating boat dock. You know, there's special money for digging out the lead that's in the ground. There's, you know, and you just gotta hustle and, and, and pull it together. So that's at least a, a gloss of the question. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so the elephant in the room, can everybody hear me? Sort of. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Uh, the elephant in the room for me is money. But not just money, I'm talking about capital, I'm talking about cultural capital. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about uh, just going back to the question of whether calling it art makes it somehow exclusive or fancy, as opposed to creativity. Um, and I think it does. I think that, Damon, I think that your decision to not use your, like, uh, some of some elements of the work that you do on your artistic CV like is a decision that's important and it's important to focus on and consider especially when artists are doing work that uh, they will put on their CV as artists uh, I think when you're talking about like, uh, <coughs> like whether to call it art or call it something else whether it's urban planning or urban design I think that that has a very strong funding element attached to it I mean you, you're not going to get city funding as readily as, a, as an artist as you will an urban planner or working within like the urban planning kind of department. So I think this is a very important issue to focus on. I believe that art and activist both are market defined terms that need to be addressed as such. Uh, and I would hope that you guys have some response. I mean, one response I have with <coughs> percent for art is that um, I work with colleagues from about 15 different city agencies so that have capital construction programs that require, are required to participate in the Percent for <coughs> Art program. And I can think of a few people who will often suggest people they know who are designers instead of artists to do commissions. Um, and the, I think the thinking is that a designer is going to be easier to work with, is going to take direction better. <laughs> um, Domesticated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's sort of like work, uh, work for hire rather than artwork. And um, um, it, I, I mean, commissioning is a delicate balance in that way anyhow. But what's interesting to me is that I've, when I first understood that, I was open to it. And then I thought, wait a minute, this is percent for art. And I think you're right. There are more jobs. There are more job jobs for designers, landscape designers. I don't know that they're that well paying or how many there really are. And, you know, to work for the city as a, an architect, you have to go through a bidding process that's kind of like the lowest bidder who's legitimate wins. <laughs> so what that means is you have to be big enough to, as like a company, as an architecture or landscape design firm, to take that kind of low price, right? I mean, that's something that we see. So <coughs> the artists don't have to go through that. The budget is fixed. Right, unless you're just an artist or an architect who works for the city. Right, because then you don't have to contract anything because you just do it in-house. But there, but there aren't artists who just work for the city. What do you mean? Yeah, I've never heard of that. <laughs> Architects do. Right. Architects True. do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm now confused. <laughs> One last question. Um, I th maybe I'll just say something yeah. in response to the last question. Um, I guess... What I would like to see is that people think about art in a different way and that people start to see art and artists as possibly having a function that's not so elite and that's not about the art marketplace and that artists can make social contributions and, uh, and contribute their creativity to situations that, that they're not allowed to now. You know, that, that it's not part of, the, of art education. It's not part of the way uh, artists are trained to think about themselves. But I, I believe that, that artists have a lot of problem-solving abilities and uh, capacity to make a contribution that is not about, you know, self-expression. But they don't get the chance. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm really interested in, in working towards. Yeah. I just want to add to that, um, since I'm not an artist, um, uh, 
I think artists always think that everybody thinks that they're so elite. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure they necessarily are. I mean, my experience with, you know, working with activists and saying, hey, we want you to think like artists, is it actually gives them a, a permission to play um, and to fail. Um, and we talk a lot about failure and, and the joys of playing and failure. And that, that for them, that's what being an artist is. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of an interesting that, that art has that power. Yes, it has cultural capital, so on and so forth. But it also has a positive element, which is, you know, it's, it's about creating something. It's about playing. It's about failing. It's about the stakes not being as high. Um, because if you screw up, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, <laughs> and I think that that's part of art that we uh, can actually, you know, all learn from. Yeah. Uh, just odd to Antonio. I think it matters Gr if it fails. <laughs> oh, no, Antonio Gramsci once said. Yeah. Um, this is speaking for the Marxist yeah. Linus. Yeah, uh, when, when, he, when he was talking about, well, what to do after the revolution, he was being very ambitious. He said, well, we, um, we're going to have to really ride hard on the economists because if the economists screw up, people can starve. But we're not going to censor the artists. Because really, if they fail, it doesn't really matter. Um, and he didn't mean it as a, as a negative thing. What he meant is that you can open it, that art can be open up for play and experimentation um, in a way that other things don't have that luxury. And so I think that we need to be, you know, we need to to use that luxury. I'll I'll just finish by taking some dissent from that. Um, you know. It, you know, and I, I think that's about a situational usage of, the, of this term or this frame. But, you know, I think m my footnote to what Maureen said is like, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff and important stuff and really worthwhile stuff that you can get messed up with. Um, <laughs> and I think if, if you have any kind of, you know, similarity to me where, like, I know, to be honest, like, whether as an artist or working in some other capacity, that the best stuff just personally speaking, that I've been involved in has been somehow I found myself in some like crazy crevice of the world of society that is like really specific. And like what I'm making is like in relationship to this thing. And I feel if I've learned like one thing, it's like it can still be fun, but like you gotta study. Because if like I'm going to try to like waste somebody's time who's like an anti foreclosure organizer, um, it is like super lame, right? If, if I don't like know what's up to the best of my ability before I enter into that situation, you know? So like go into unfamiliar places, but like study up before you get there. Thank you. That's good advice. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Wow, <laughs>